Mary Penzer, donc, qui est euh, euh, historienne et conservatrice de la photographie, euh, chercheuse et enseignante à l'Université de Boston, qui dans les années 90 a été conservatrice de la photographie pour la National Portrait Gallery à Smithsonian Institution. Elle est également co-auteur de l'ouvrage « Things as they are, photojournalism in context since 1955 ». Elle a contribué également à plusieurs ouvrages qui combinent son intérêt pour le photojournalisme et les archives. Je cite par exemple l'ouvrage « The Public Life of Photographs » publié, paru en 2016, ou encore elle a contribué à l'ouvrage « Life Magazine and the Power of Photography » publié en 2020. Elle a également écrit sur la photographie de guerre au 19e et 20e siècle, dont un ouvrage intitulé « Matthew Brady and the Image of History » paru en 1997. Et euh, elle a publié de nombreux euh, articles euh, dans le magazine euh, Aperture ou encore le Wall Street Journal. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Mary. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today. So, Please. So, um, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, great thanks to Audrey who managed to make this happen. Um, I'm very excited to be here with all of you. And um, I'm sorry, I have to speak in English. I can understand you, but I can't uh, go ahead. Anyway, um, let's get going. I need to share my screen, right? Here we go. Okay, um, and slideshow, and slideshow, ça va? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, is this on? Are you? Um, the, uh, my uh, study of this, uh, Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, my study of magazine photography owes a lot to the early work of Siegfried Krakauer, who described the blizzard of photographs produced by illustrated magazines in, in 1927 already. This quote, um, I put it in French on the right, uh, comes from his 1927 essay, Photography, that appeared in the Frankfurter Zeitung. Um, photography is bound in time precisely the same way as fashion. It is translucent when modern and abandoned when old. The effect of an outfit which was worn um, only recently is comical. Once the grandmother's costume has lost its relationship to the present, it will no longer be funny. It will be peculiar, like an ocean dwelling octopus. The photographic archive assembles in effigy the last elements of a nature emptied of meaning. And he talks about the um, sort of random and artificial uh, assemblage of, of a photographic archive comprised of all the images from, uh, uh, from all of these illustrated magazines. He imagines it and actually What I'm going to be talking about is the picture collection at Life Magazine, uh, Time Life Inc., which included Life Magazine, um, which realized this uh, chaotic collection of pictures and tried to make a connection between them. I often feel when I'm talking about this era as if I'm describing a palace made of ice, once enormous and sparkling, now only a puddle of water. But for most of the 20th century, from the 1930s through the 1990s, the Time Incorporated Empire, those widely circulated magazines, including Time, Life, and Fortune, occupied the center of the American collective memory. And this will be an American-centric presentation. Um, these are the three buildings in which Life magazine had its offices. And they're all still here today. The Chrysler Building, built in 1930, Rockefeller Center, where Time Life occupied the top seven floors of this particular building. And then the Time Life Building, kind of modernist um, uh, uh, incarnation, built in 1960, when where 
Time Inc. had its offices until 2019. Uh, the transcript of the title refers to a document printed in the form of a very fat dictionary, which was imagined by a person, Doris O'Neill, uh, who from 1952 to 1998 was director of the Time Inc. picture collection, which was the repository for every image used or created by the magazines published by Time Inc. Publishing Empire. And so in a way, she is one of the early um, professional iconographers, um, although it was within this institution only. The transcript was her guide for cataloging the many millions of photographs created and stored and used by time, life, people, Force yeah. Illustrated, money, and also um, interestingly, uh, given what Olivier was talking about, this was also a source for the illustration of the thousands of time life books that were published um, from the 1950s uh, through the 1990s. And they were published in series. The series on, on photography is actually quite good. Uh, and this is a page uh, out of this transcript. Um, and just to show you uh, the kind of chaotic assembly of topics that Krakauer might have imagined. So we've got abortion, abstract art, accidents, aircraft accidents, you know, um, animals, animals attacked by animals, auto accidents, sports and auto racing accidents. It, it's, uh, it's hard to understand how this really worked. But the end of the Time Inc. empire, these are the mag covers of magazines from 1960. Uh, the end of the empire came with the end of the century. Uh, by the 1990s, digitization and its partner, keyword search, uh, made the picture collection and O'Neill's transcript obsolete. In a long string of corporate mergers, Time Inc. lost its autonomy. Uh, media industry changed. Meredith Publications, uh, a conservative magazine consortium, bought out Time Inc. in 2017 for over $2 billion, uh, mostly for the power of its brands. Of course, life was already gone, but it continues as a digital resource. Um, Time lives on, People Magazine lives on, the rest of them many hundreds of magazines by then were discontinued. Meredith also got the whole picture collection. Life had already spun off its digital access to Life magazines to Google Books, where it is possible to view uh, virtually every page of every magazine, uh, every issue of Life magazine. Today, the picture collection is stored off-site and is run from an office in the Meredith New York offices. So the actual picture collection is inaccessible, but the collection of images that were published is, it can be found. The, um, the transcript held the key to organizing the many millions of images that Time Inc. generated. About two thirds of these pictures were devoted to people and personalities. The remaining third of the images were filed according to subject headings codified in the transcript. And here's yet another one of our women uh, picture editors inside of Time Life. Um, I had originally hoped to analyze the transcript for its biases, prejudices, and assumptions to show how life's inherent point of view distorted or influenced or even changed the meaning of the images that entered its collection. A former employee shared his copy of, the, of a late, very late PDF version of the transcript. Still incomplete, it was very useful. Um, and uh, I have to credit COVID as well as the inaccessible Meredith offices for making research challenging. Um, I relied on a very few sources. Uh, the Time Inc. files at the New York Historical Society, and especially an in-house publication, 
um, and uh, for all Time Inc. employees, and also a small group of oral histories with former employees of the picture collection. Um, uh, thanks to these interviews, I began to understand how the transcript was used. The interviews also returned me to the days of paper and this material aspect to the problem I'm addressing is very important. My subjects all arrived at Time Inc. in the mid 1970s and all stayed inside the photography field in New York. Susan Kismarek retired as a curator at the Museum of Modern Art not too long ago. Philip Gefter went to the New York Times and recently published a biography of Richard Avedon. Uh, Beth Iskander stayed at the time life until the end of the 20th century and was the director of the picture collection um, and oversaw the beginning of digitizing. Around 2000, she joined the photography department at Sotheby's New York. They all described their time in the picture collection as the best education they ever received. They all described the files as containing the history of the world. But we have to remember that they're hearkening back to the time of the mid 70s and the files of Time Life Picture Collection really could make up a pictorial history of the world as it was then, or at least as it was seen uh, from the perspective of uh, New York City. They all worked with Doris O'Neill and they all learned the system from its inventor. So this, this system is really, um, lasts a long generation that's still with us. Um, the pic this is not a picture of the interior of, of the picture of the, of the Time Life Building of 1960. But it is a still from a movie from 1960, um, The Apartment, in which Jack Lemon is an employee of a, a huge insurance company. And this space is very much like the kind of space that my interviewers op worked in. Um, they described the, the whole 28th floor being relayed to photography that half of it was for the picture collection, the other half was for the photo lab. So it was just photography central. Um, the walls were made of glass uh, facing west, uh, made for some very beautiful sunsets over New Jersey. Um, and the desks where the researchers worked were placed against the windows. The center was comprised of filing cabinets uh, on the pillars, and here's some pillars, um, were telephones. And above the telephones were lights of different colors, white and red and green. Only the res only special people could answer those phones and the lights told you which magazines were, were calling. Uh, the people who were calling were um, research workers, at the individual magazines, the people who answered them were also called researchers, but they were inside the picture collection. Um, the people who were calling, um, uh, consistent with what we've been saying all today, were all women who worked for the editors of the magazines um, and the writers of the magazines, but they didn't write or edit anything. They just sent requests. And they were said to be um, uh, well-educated young women who had come to New York mostly to find a husband. But the people and the researchers and people I talked to from the 28th floor were, had a lot of work to do and they had to interpret the requests they received um, in a way that could correspond to real pictures. So Kismarek described getting an, a request for everything you have on Vietnam, and she had to quiz her, uh, the requester, to be a little bit more specific. Um, now, while Life magazine was not America's first picture magazine, or the only picture magazine, 
It was certainly the most famous one from the time it arrived in 1936. And this is a publicity shot showing a young woman taking the very first issue of Life off the newsstand. Here's Time, The New Yorker, and all of these magazines that were all using pictures uh, thanks to changing technology. Um, the, uh, the first editors of Life didn't really know quite where their photographs would come from an early, uh, early imagining of, of what became life, thought they would survey all the incoming images from a week and pick out the best ones. Um, and in that case, they, they got images, a lot of images from the press services in America and also in Europe. They arranged to get the first look at things so that they could um, scoop everybody. They got pictures from Hollywood. They asked, eventually they asked readers to send pictures in, which became a very popular feature. But they did realize they would need their own staff. And um, in the first year, they had about five people, including Margaret Burke White, who came from Fortune magazine, and Albert, uh, Alfred Eisenstadt, who had already started his career in Germany uh, and was one of the first masters of the Leica. Um, photographers shot the assignments, sent the film back, and it was processed in the photo lab, given a set number, and filed with a proof sheet. So picture editors for the magazines ordered the prints they wanted from these proof sheets, um, and, and then they kept everything. So even after just a year, Life didn't know what to do with all of these incoming photographs. Uh, this is the 30th floor of Rockefeller Center and um, in what became the picture morgue. First, Life thought they would start a, an agency and sell rights to pictures they didn't use. That didn't really work, um, but they wanted to keep the pictures. And in 1937, there was no precedent for organizing this mass of information. And here's where we're intersecting again with so many, uh, so much of what we've already talked about here is a world full of women. Uh, um, there, some categories were, were simple. They were personalities filed under, under uh, alphabetically by name, but then there were the ones that were filed by subject or seemed to be required by subject. And that is where they ran into trouble not only where to put them, but how to file them once you once you put them there. So an in-house story described asking for help from professional librarians. Um, the picture collection defeated them. The subjects were too numerous and too idiosyncratic. In 1947, they, they explained that these librarians were never able to understand Time Inc.'s peculiar need for categories like cobwebs or mermaids or wash days. And here in the 1970s, they're still talking about wash days. This is a 1940s picture um, of a mermaid. Um, so Time Inc. had to make up their own system. And uh, Susie Eggleston here was responsible for that first um, pass. By 1947, um, she was head of a department that employed over 15 people. Two took orders, two did filing, three worked for Time, and these two young men were the ones who worked part-time for, for Time magazine, which was the serious news news and the sort of the prime pick, prime uh, journal of, of the empire. Um, five uh, cataloged images from wire services, four um, plus the department head worked with photographs that came in from their own magazines and one person supervised the categories, adding new ones as necessary. The organization was better, but really it, it relied almost entirely on the institutional memory of the staff. This changed um, or began to change with the 1948 arrival of Doris O'Neill, here seen in 1972. She had been an art school graduate and a librarian uh, who had kept her own picture file since she was a child cutting out photographs from the newspaper. So she was a photo fiend from her you know, childhood. When she arrived, the picture morgue, as it was called, held roughly 2 million images. 
Time Inc. published only Time, Life, and Fortune at that time. By the time Life folded in 1972, the collection totaled 18 million pictures. Lloyd's of London would not insure the picture collection at that point because the value was beyond ordinary computation. And I simply don't have a reliable figure for how many images um, the picture collection contained when Meredith bought it in 2017. O'Neill's insight, whether she invented it or simply understood how to apply it, was that one picture contained information about many things. So that along with a main subject heading, say the place, and this would be the place where the image was filed, she asked catalogers to list every other thing in the picture that might be useful or be a detail that someone could remember. Her system was organized so that if a person remembered only one aspect of a picture, it could be located through cross-references. These are the precursors of keywords and each cross-reference merited a card. The card was filed in a catalog. If you could think of a category where the cards were filed, you could go there, search and find all the stories that contained the information that you were looking for. So um, in 1972, uh, this collection was, this picture was categorized um, according to Nixon and all the names of the people in his cabinet. And then it would be under these life uh, time inc categories. US dash government dash cabinet dash Nixon 1972 or Vietnam dash politics dash revolution dash Viet Cong dash strategy 1972 US dash government dash presidency dash buildings dash White House dash interior 1972 and lighting fixtures chandeliers. Um, the catalogers followed a pattern from general to specific, typed up cards for every single heading that could be applied. And also the verso of the photograph included all of this information. The public nation name, uh, date and page where the story appeared, whatever caption information was available. Uh, the, in addition to the main subject headings, there was a list of all the additional subject headings and then the set number, if the image had been generated by a staff photographer for the magazine. And then as, as it was retrieved and used, there would be stamps information for where else this picture appeared. This portrait of Teddy Roosevelt was an especially uh, widely circulated one. And you can see all the different times it was used here by life, uh, here by time, again by time, again by time, again by fortune. And um, eventually O'Neill created a, a uh, special category uh, for famous pictures. <laughs> and this made it into that special group. This entire process took place on paper, paper photographs, paper folders, uh, paper file cards and file cabinets to hold them. And it required people to carry out the functions of making, typing, filing, retrieving, and refiling the pictures. At one point, the floor was reinforced to bear up the weight of all the files. Um, eventually, it was moved to an underground level where there was nothing to bother, nothing could fall in. Um, and the effort to accumulate all these pictures had a very firm concrete deadline because the production, the making of the magazines was a concrete process. Uh, at Friday night, the Time magazine closed. It was everything, a whole stack of objects was shipped off to R.R. Donnelly in Chicago where these were the kinds of presses that were used to create the magazine and then uh, print the magazine and mail it out. Um, and there, and this was the, um, you know, end product of all of this work. So how did this, um, how did this process work? I'm going to go through a, some examples. 
the pictures and the um, and some of the uh, categories that I retrieved from the, the transcript. Um, there, it's not a complete process, and I would have liked to have had more information. Um, but I hope it will show uh, what the transcript enabled the catalogers to do, and then also show how it necessarily fell short. So this image from 1956 uh, by Gordon Parks could be cataloged under children. You would go and discover that children had a special subset for Negro for, uh, and then if this was a group of white and black children, um, that would also uh, be here. And, um, and that this children Negro is where you would start uh, and boys and girls would be secondary. Also, you could have education students, American Negro, families, American Negro. And these are the kinds of categories that the transcript was asking you to apply to these pictures. If you're doing Negroes, you could come into all of these different um, categories so that children Negro, um, models Negro, slavery, youth US Negro, living standards US Negro, uh, US people and culture, a very large uh, group of pictures um, and the category people and culture included a lot of things under every, um, under every nation, uh, et cetera. So here is, uh, here quickly is the story by Gordon Parks. Um, there were called old people Negro, which would be perfect for this. Um, but there's also families, US Negro, agriculture, farmers, US Negro, beauty culture. Here you can see a man is giving um, a family member a shave in their, in their kitchen, but it is shaving and this would be a subject. Also, small town scenes, U.S. South, Alabama, people and culture, U.S. houses, and then, I don't know, wood frame. And here's a grandmother with her, with her grandchild, and there is a category for grandmothers. Here you have roads, U.S. Alabama, religion, church, U.S. interior. There's a tree. What kind of tree? Again, children, Negro, um, and then more sophisticated categories like US people and culture, Negroes discrimination. You can see that these um, water fountains are labeled white only, colored only, and fathers doing typical, typical types doing fatherly things like helping your daughter reach the water fountain. Um, Again, small town scenes, US, stores, US, general. For small stores that settle a variety of objects, stores, clothing, stores, window displays, um, people and culture, um, kitchens, laundry. And then here are our little girls who are standing on one side of the fence uh, that they are not allowed to cross. Um, and I, don't exactly know how they were going to treat that. Rooms, kitchens, people and culture, youth, US, Negro for all these young people that appear in these pictures. But then there's also a gun, a shotgun. There's rooms, bedrooms, there's women, laboring types. There's a schoolroom with desks and a blackboard, as well as an antique stove. Um, whose category I really couldn't quite find. And finally, there, this one would help be categorized under teachers American Negro. Um, you include both black and white here when together, they aren't, which was the point of, of Gordon Parks' story, principals, college students. Then there's music, education, individual music lessons, Musical instruments include people playing instruments, keyboard, wind. Um, and then finally, uh, race prejudice. There is a special category for discrimination in travel, 
but we also have a nice illustration of families, Negro, or living standards, Negro, which would be um, a, a larger than uh, an original, than someone might expect in 1956. How do you handle discrimination? Uh, this includes discrimination against whites in favor of blacks, like in employment, or you could um, distinguish it from uh, dim, dim, discrimination could be demonstration. Um, see also US people and culture, Negroes demonstrations. Uh, nobody in Gordon Parks' story was demonstrating. This is um, kind of an omnibus story about discrimination in high and 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 the attempt to edu uh, integrate high schools in 1957. So here we get race relations. Uh, you only use that for good relations. For bad relations, you want U.S. people and culture, Negroes. Oh, I'm sorry. Integration. Um, also, see also prejudice. So you can see. This is, uh, you can see how this goes. A very useful, a very useful category was opinion for demonstration, protests, rallies, or on matters of education policy. So these guys would appear under opinion as well, as would this woman who was uh, objecting to the niggers uh, entering her children's school and um, good for life, they showed the police um, shoving this lady into her car. Um, here is an integrated meeting, um, planning a demonstration uh, anyway. And, um, and the particularly effective story was on the freedom rides from 1961. Uh, Paul Schuster, Schutzer rode on the bus with these demonstrators demonstrated US South freedom rides because it was a it was a well known event, but it's also transportation bus US Armed Forces National National Guard US Armed Forces uniform helmet US Armed Forces rifle and then um, Negroes youth US. Um, I'm hauling this out just because here was an example of good race relations where blacks and whites were working together. Um, and it's also an example of religious opinion civil rights, because uh, this is a group of clergymen who were joining the um, the freedom rides demonstrating inside of a bus terminal here in order to get arrested. Um, a final um, story I, I wanted to share with you uh, is by uh, Cornell Kappa, um, and it is about the refugees uh, who came out of the 1967 war uh, between uh, the 67, Six Day War, Israel against the Arab world, and uh, in which they acquired the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and Cornell Kappa, uh, good for him, took on the, the difficult subject of the people who were made refugees by this battle that um, the Israelis were celebrating so um, excitedly. Here, how are you gonna file these pictures? Arabs, Palestine, then there's Israel, occupied territories. There's Palestine, people and culture, but only include those who live in areas now, both Israel and Jordan, which would be the West Bank, and there we have children and we also have a grandmother. And we also here have um, uh, Arab family life. Uh, the fact that the family is completely dislocated um, doesn't figure into this particular category, excuse me. Here are caravans um, plotting to new barren places these images would be also filed under the different kinds of landscapes that, um, that it are shown. Uh, here's a town that was abandoned in the course of the war. And my problem was trying to figure out how to categorize these refugees. There's 
migration, see also politics, refugees. Migration, see also Jews, refugees. Migration, see also wars, the name of the war, six day war, refugees, country, well, what country do they come from? Um, politics, refugees. Um, and Palestine, see also Jews, refugee ships. This is left over from World War II or Palestine, see also Jews, refugees, Palestine, uh, 1945 categories that don't apply in 1967. Um, but there were places that these images could easily be, be um, located. And one of those very useful categories was expressions. See also fear, grief, fatigue, kissing, pain. Um, and this would obviously uh, fill, uh, uh, be located and uh, get several different cross references. This is a, a family um, separating at the, at the new border um, between Israel and um, the West Bank. So I hope that hasn't been too, uh, too rapid, but my um, conclusions uh, were not what I expected exactly. The transcript was effective because O'Neill adhered to an institutional culture that put Time Inc. at the center of America and the world. And in 1938, they did a big issue on America and had a whole survey story. Here's America by air, it's big. Here's a landscape, it's beautiful. And they end up in New York City. And not only do they end up in New York City at Rockefeller Center, the biggest tourist spot in the nation, they end up in the top seven floors uh, where life, time life offices were located. And this is the view that they had of the world from those offices. And so this is the view of, um, of, of Time Inc. Um, that lays at the heart of, of the transcript. Um, but the constant amendments to the transcript show that the picture collection was more liberal and more curious than um, magazines that it helped produce. I mean, here in 1952, they're seeing the first pictures of Hiroshima from the Japanese, uh, from Japanese journalists. It merits a picture on the uh, front cover, but the cover has nothing to do with what's inside. And um, and how do you cope with a magazine or a culture that allows this kind of contrast to flourish? Uh, happily, you know, O'Neill was not content to follow that regime. Um, and she took her job seriously. She insisted on accuracy. She was really quite fearless in looking at pictures and determined to see every element in there. The version of the transcript I found was loaded with intricate efforts to catalog the civil rights movement. Um, and um, it had separate categories for every war you could know about at that moment. And the expression categories promised rich discoveries if it was ever possible to consult them again. You know, I would cut straight to the chase if I was looking for uh, information about some kind of um, violent event who had an opinion, who was laughing. That's where I would want to start. Uh, I, I came away from this exercise really actually quite optimistic. In every instance, the images far exceed what any category or set of words could capture. And I think also that this um, sense of straining against the def definitions um, got only um, more uh, aggressive or more obvious um, as we moved into the present, so that um, Paul Schutzer on the bus with the protesters really had no um, uh, had no illusion that he was going to be opt uh, that he was going to be um, objective about what he saw. That the idea about opinion was becoming incorporated into the pictures, which also made them harder to categorize. Um, 
So the picture collection folks, I think were really quite lucky though. They had the files that O'Neill established and the army of workers who cataloged and filed them. So the research who, researchers who uh, consulted them um, had a lot to choose from. Uh, this is very different from a search that we might conduct today um, using a keyword and dependent on um, what someone has decided to scan. So um, uh, my last slide now, um, those who have inherited the picture collection are not eager to share their wealth, but where is the wealth? What is the value of an ice palace once summer arrives? Thank you very much, Mary. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you very much for, your, for this exciting uh, presentation. Um, Est-ce qu'il y a des, des questions, des réactions? I hope it wasn't too fast. Hmm. No, it was perfect, but many things <laughs> in our mind. Um, wow. Audrey ben Oui, du coup, je vais commencer. Merci beaucoup, Marie. Euh, moi, j'aimerais savoir si tu, tu as pu observer euh, ou comparer avec euh, des classements euh, qui viendraient d'Europe euh, et de France, mmh. sachant qu'on euh, sait qu'il y a des échanges de photographies dans un sens et dans l'autre, dans ces grands magazines. Mmh. Et... Euh, euh, Enfin, comparer des classements, c'est difficile, mais au moins, est-ce que, euh, par exemple, l'importation de photographies euh, de magazines français dans euh, la base de Time ou dans l'autre sens, euh, est-ce qu'elle se fait avec, euh, le même, enfin, avec ces mots-clés ou est-ce qu'il y a une rediscussion des mots-clés en les intégrant euh, dans sa culture um... Est-ce que c'est une question ou non, c'est une observation? Non, um, je ne sais pas où, où on pourrait uh, trouver uh, ce clé pour, uh, c'est pas Paris Match ou, um, ou à Londres pour uh, uh, um, Picture Post. Je ne sais pas s'il y a un clé uh, comparable. Um, pour ces autres pour ces autres journaux euh, um, euh, et, 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 um, on doit uh, on doit chercher c'est pas tu, tu, tu n'as pas euh, trouvé d'image qui viendrait euh, euh d'Europe et avec des fiches comme ça sur... Oh, ouais. euh, ça... Um, I'll have to just say, um, because the research is just starting, um, I, I was interested in, in, in matching up the, the, the um, transcript with the pictures. Um, The way to do that would be um, <clears throat> to go back to a magazine that was reprinting a lot of images from Europe and then try to match up how they were being used. Or you could find a, the same picture being used in Europe for one journal and in, at li in life for another and try to see how the information was changing or how the emphasis changed according to the publication. Um, if Meredith would only let me into their picture collection, wherever it is, it would be really fun to go see the, how, what they did with the pictures that were coming from AFP, you know, or RAFO. Um, but until we can see the actual objects, we won't know what they did. I mean, that's another place to look. Um, I did think it was pretty interesting uh, how many people moved through the picture collection 
And I know um, Abigail Salm Godot, as Olivier mentioned, was a picture researcher in, in France and she was uh, in the 70s and she was in and out of the Magnum offices all the time. Um, and how, and the, the story about how Magnum reprocessed and reused its pictures um, is the subject of a, of a, of a new book um, called the, um, uh, by, um, uh, Celui de Nadia Ber. Oui, Nadia Ber. Oui, c'est ça. The network um, agency, quelque chose comme ça. Yeah, decisive, the decisive story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she did a lot of research. And again, it was back inside this whole feminized world that was invisible, except it wasn't. Um, and she was able to interview uh, a lot of people. Uh, and I think a lot of her subject matter would intersect with this, this um, effort to categorize and, 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 and organize. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, merci bien. Merci bien for Nadia Bear's book. That's very good. Um, moi, j'ai une question qui prolonge un peu euh, celle d'Audrey sur la, la comparaison. Vous avez travaillé aussi sur euh, la collection de la picture collection de Romana Yavitz à, à la New York Public Library. Oui, c'est vrai. Est-ce que vous voyez des différences dans les, la classification, les mots-clés dans une collection publique à destination d'un large public, comme la collection oui. Romana Yavitz et la, la classification dans une collection privée. That is very. That's a very good question. Um, they, uh, th although the picture collection at the library um, had uh, had file folders that w had much less sophisticated uh, demarcations, um, they were they used they. For the reason that the people who were using their pictures were not uh, photo editors or magazine editors, but they were uh, often artists or designers or um, teachers who were looking for things that were much simpler to describe. So there, there was geography and you know France, Paris, buildings, Notre Dame, stuff like that. Um, Uh, but also the picture collections were not entirely open for public research. You could go travel in the bins, but you also had to connect, collect, uh, contact librarians and they would bring things out to you, which isn't always clear in the descriptions of the collection. And I think those interior subject headings were more precise or more more sophisticated but i think it mostly had to do with the audience they were serving um because the uh public library had what costume designers would want you know people um 19 you know world war one uh men women costumes and they would also take away a huge number of images for research but not for publication um There's another archive, there was a German archive of, of iconography of costumes um, that, that worked in a similar way to the public library in that you could also check these out like books, whereas the Time Inc. picture archive never went outside the building. Merci beaucoup, Marie, pour votre réponse. Est-ce qu'il y a une dernière question avant que cette matinée se termine moi, j'avais une toute peut-être une petite question. Euh, Est-ce que, est que vous, vous avez travaillé avec des chercheurs euh, qui étudient la langue avec euh, euh, vraiment la question du, des, des mots, en fait, euh, qui seraient des spécialistes de, voilà, de, du, mm. du champ lexical, des choses comme ça? Um, Do you understand? Yes, yes, I haven't. Um, I think partly because 
of working inside Life magazine, um, as I showed that culture was, was so uh, uh, enclosed and mm -hmm. then um, and complete. And I don't know what happened to the categories say after 1975. Um, and I don't know what the digitization process did to the categories either. Um, Beth, Beth Eskander could tell me more about that. And I, I'm not a linguist, but it would be fun to talk to a, you know, a, a real semiotically mm -hmm. trained person um, to talk about the changes or the shifts mm -hmm. uh, to get different incarnations. Um, the other thing would be just to get the backs of the pictures because they would also include any updated information about new cross cross references that were applied um, as things changed or as a picture moved from being a present um, record to one of, of historical importance and that would change. I, I really want to thank Audrey very much for this invitation because it provided an opportunity to look into this um, for the first time. And um, I, I'm really grateful to all of you and, and for this wonderful audience. Thank you very much.